This morning, our scripture comes from Ecclesia, uh, from Ephesians. I almost said Ecclesiastes, did Ephesians. I've been reading a lot of Ecclesiastes over the past few days, so don't be surprised if you don't hear a message from there pretty soon. Ephesians 1, verse 1 through 14. The Bible tells us, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace be with you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and to be blameless in his sight, in his love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. In him who we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To put into effect, when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring all unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. The purpose in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal the promised Holy Spirit who is deposited, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession and to praise and to the praise of His glory. You know, the book of Ephesians is a wonderful book. It, it was written for the believer who might be tempted to neglect or ignore all their spiritual resources for the here and now. You know, I want to share with you this morning a little, about, a little bit about uh, Ephesians. Capital One. Many of you know what I'm talking about when I say Capital One. They've had commercials of crazy things happening. But the one thing that Capital One credit card commercials always tells us is that we are always protected. At the end of the commercial, they always ask the question, what is in your wallet? The book of Ephesians has been called by many to be the believer's bank or the Christian's checkbook in the treasure house, if you will, of the Bible. There are also the Bible has, the uh, book of Ephesians has been called God's letter to the church. And the reason that it is called these things is because the main theme of Ephesians is, is our riches that we get through Jesus Christ. I can't wait to see what we're going to hear today. I'm like the little boy whose friend has moved away. And he gets a letter. He runs back from the mailbox anxious to see him with excitement. He opens that letter and he ponders over every word. And that's the way I hope that we feel today as we read from God's word this morning. Be patient with me just a minute. You know, 
within the next few weeks, our political leaders will be delivering some very important messages to us. As a matter of fact, I just heard a few days ago that the governor is getting ready to reveal his State of the State address. And we all know, I can't wait to hear President Biden's State of the Union address. But I asked a question this morning. If we had to give a State of the Church address, what would we say? Would we talk about all the ways that we mess up? Would we talk about all the ways that our church leaders across this country have succumbed to immorality? Would we talk about conflicts that even we have in our own denomination today? Or would we talk about how blessed we are? Would we talk about what Jesus Christ has done for us? And that's where Paul started when he wrote the first verse in the book of Ephesians, is he asked us to do things. He wanted to remind us of the tremendous blessings that all of us have through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In this passage that we read today, Paul starts by getting the church, getting their focus back on what is important, on the way it should be. And before he goes on to talk about the way we should live or the way we should worship or the way we should treat other people, he wants us to focus and refocus on what's important. He wants to point out to us the tremendous blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. I hope that all of us will spend this first Sunday of 2022 being focused on refocusing what our what our relationship should be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we listen this morning to that text, I, want, I hope that each one of us was able to see the blessings that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. When we see those blessings, when we hear those blessings, I want each one of us to be able to leave this place this morning praising his name for those blessings that he gives to us. But I think in order to do that, that we've got to look at four blessings that Paul tells us about in this passage that God has given to his church. The first blessing is that God has a plan for his church. It's a plan that's revealed in verses 3 through 6 as we, as we read. Have you ever worked on a project that seems like Whoever was in charge had no vague idea of what they were doing. It was just chaotic. <coughs> Is it not absolutely miserable to work on a project like that? But what a blessing it is when we work on a project with a leader who has everything planned out and everything goes the way it should be. It's well organized. It's the same way with God as he builds his church. He had a plan for his people since before the beginning of time. His plan was always to have blessed us. God approached this plan organized and in a certain way. But you know, as humans, so many times we get confused when we think about blessings. But what is Paul actually talking about in those verses that we read this morning when he talks about a blessing? Paul is talking this morning as we read Remember that he was sitting in a prison in Rome when he read it, when he wrote this. And I doubt seriously if, if Paul was thinking about material blessings as he sat there in that cold, dark jail. But he was talking about spiritual blessings. And God planned them for all of us from eternity past. God planned them. He planned always to bless his children. He planned to bless us by making us holy. And that passage says, He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation. He wants to bless us. He wants to bless us by making us holy before the foundation of the world. That's a long time ago. But He knew what He wanted to bless His church with. God planned that we should always live free of bondage and we should always live free from the power of sin. He didn't do this out of obligation to us. He did this out of love. God planned the blessing and he planned to make us holy. 
But the biggest blessing, I think, of all is that he planned to adopt all of us as his sons. Verse 5 says, Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. There is nothing, my friends, in any of us that would compel him to accept us. Think about that. We're all sinners. He, however, accepts us. He accepts us purely. And he accepts us simply out of the eternal love that he has for each one of us. A love that he has had for us even before we were created. That was his plan all along. His plan was to take us as rebellious, selfish creatures and to adopt us. To adopt us to the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He planned to bless us in Christ. Blessing us by adopting us and blessed us by making us holy. The first blessing God has given his church is that he has a plan in Christ. But not only does God have a plan in Christ, he also makes provision for his church in Christ. In verses 7 through 10, God makes provision for his church from before the beginning of time. God knew that his creation would rebel against him. He knew. Irma and I have two wonderful sons that we love and we wouldn't trade for anything. But I asked the question, if you could imagine that somehow God would reveal to a young couple that they would have a child, that child would grow up to curse them, that child would grow up to spit on them, to abuse them, and eventually brutally murder them, do you think they would go ahead and, and have that child? Do you think they would hope for conception, or do you think they would use the best birth control they could find to prevent that baby's conception? God knew what his creation would, it would be. He knew that we would rebel. He knew that we would curse him, and he knew that we would put his son to death on a cruel Roman cross. He knew that. But he loved us enough to create us anyway. He loved us enough to create us, although we rebelled. He loved us to provide, he loved us enough to provide a way to restore our relationship with him. And in that rebellion, it, it, it's as if we're enslaved by sin. It's as if we're captured by the devil, but God has made provision for us. He has purchased us back from the grip of sin. And that's, I think, what the word redeemed means. I think that God brought us back from the master of sin and the rebellion that we had chosen. His provision for us cost him a lot. As a matter of fact, it cost him everything. Think about it. God gave up his power and his throne in heaven temporarily in order, the, and we know that because in Philippians 2 it tells us he made himself of no reputation. That literally means that he emptied himself. He emptied himself and he came to this earth as a baby and he walked in the dirt for 33 years. He came to be rejected. He came to be abused mocked and eventually he was killed and he did it for one reason to make provision for us he did it that we might as verse 7 tells us to have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace god provides redemption for us through the shed blood of his son jesus christ god has a plan for his church in christ he makes provision for his church of Christ, and he also fulfills a purpose for his church of Christ. Verses 11 and 12 reveal that purpose for the church. There is a lot of talk these days about purpose. It seems that people today are spending a lot of time seeking their purpose in life. You know, the quest throughout the second half of this century to the 20th century was to go for the American dream. The goal was to have a nice house, to have two cars, to have lots of stuff. But that still wasn't enough. When we had enough, we wanted even more. 
what we had did not give us a sense of purpose. You know, it reminded me of a story that I read about a man who was visiting his friend. And he went to his house and he found him sitting at the breakfast table looking all downhearted, long face. And he asked him, he said, friend, what's the matter? And he said, four weeks ago, four weeks ago, I had an uncle to die and left me $80,000. Three weeks ago, I had a friend to die and left me $400,000. Last week, I had an aunt to die that left me $1.5 million. Yeah. His friend said, well, I know it's hard to lose your friend and family. But said, just look at the joys they have left you. And he said, I can't imagine why you're so downhearted. And the friend told him, said, because nobody's died this week and left me anything. <laughs> That's why Jesus Christ did not leave us inheritance that was material. Jesus left us an inheritance that was in Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us our inheritance is, is, in, is in Jesus Christ. And that gives us purpose. He gives us purpose. And verse 11 tells, him, tells us we are predestined according to the purpose of Him who worked out all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, today we don't have to get into some debate, as I heard like in Sunday school, about predestination. I feel the same way that y'all will remember a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was one of the greatest Baptist preachers of all time. Someone, even they, for a while, they even termed him as the prince of preachers. Somebody asked him one time how he reconciled the concept of predestination and the sovereignty of God and the concept that man has a free will to choose his eternal destruction and designation. Mr. Spurgeon's answer, I think, was classic. He said, I see no need to reconcile between friends. In other words, the Bible teaches us that God is sovereign. The Bible teaches us that man is responsible for his own actions. We're responsible to act in accordance with God's will. And because God is in control, we're responsible to obey Him. That is our purpose. Our purpose is to obey God, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's unpopular, or even when it doesn't make sense. We are to obey Him because God is in control. He is in control and we will and all things will work according to the counsel of his will. His promise is to work all things together for good. Verse 12 tells us why. Because it says that we should be the praise of his glory. You see, it's not about us. Our salvation is not about us. Our salvation is all about God. It's about bringing honor and glory and praise to the God who saved us. That's our purpose. He works all things together for our good in order that we can recognize that He's the one who did it. He's the one who does it and He's the one who deserves the praise. God gives us purpose to praise Him. He gives us purpose to praise Him because of what He's done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. God has a plan for His church in Christ. God makes provision for His church in Christ. He has... <clears throat> he blesses us in so many ways. But He also does one more thing. He keeps a promise for His church in Christ. Verses 13 and 14 tell us that promise. When God blesses us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, He seals His blessings with the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit that gives us promise. For many, many years, kings before Him would make decrees and they would write those decrees down and they would seal that with a stamp into wax that would designate and tell everyone that this was an order of the king that it could not be violated, it could not be broken. It signified that it was authentic. 
everyone who saw this seal knew that the decree was from the king and it wasn't from anyone else. And since the design of that seal was so unique to the king, it was recognizable by everything. It signified ownership. If the king placed his decree on, on his seal on any kind of decree, it showed people who it belonged to. The king used his seal to mark land. He used his seal to mark property and deeds. If it had its seal, it belonged to him. That was the kind of seal that Paul was talking about when he wrote verse 13. Paul says that after hearing the word of truth and trusting in Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Just like the king seal, Paul, that Paul was thinking about on that day, sitting in that prison. God's seal is one of a kind. There's no more like it. It's instantly recognizable as his personal seal. The Holy Spirit seal cannot be broken. It cannot be violated. It cannot be revoked. And if it's counterfeited, people will soon quickly found, find that out. The Holy Spirit seal means that we belong to a king. We're in his possession. We are his possession. And we are his... And his possession, his possession, the things that we say, the things that we do, should always represent him. Should always speak his word. And when we speak his word, and when we show people that we are of the Holy Spirit, we do this with the very same authority as if it came from God's very own mouth. But not only does God bless us with the Holy Spirit of promise for a seal, he blessed us with the Holy Spirit of promise for a guarantee. When we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and we're sealed by His Holy Spirit, God guarantees us a place with Him eternally in the heavens. Paul put it this way in Philippians 1.6, Being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of redemption. My friends, God will always finish what He starts in our lives. He's promised it. He's sealed it with the Holy Spirit of promise and He has guaranteed it. Not for our glory. Not for our glory does He do this. But the passage says, unto the praise of His glory. This morning we started out talking about our focus being back on Christ. I asked the question, where is our focus this morning? Is our focus on ourselves? Is it on our feelings? Is it focused on our own needs? Is it focused on how busy we are and how much stuff that we've got to do? Is it on focused on some personal disappointment or hurt that we've gone through in our lives? My friends, it's time for us to get our focus back on Jesus this morning. It's time that you, we praise God and we thank Him for His blessings that He has given to us in Jesus Christ. Do you need to praise Him for the plan that He has for you? Do you need to praise Him for the provision for you in Christ? Do you need to praise Him for the purpose for you in Christ? For his promise for you in Christ are Jesus has a plan. He has a plan. He has provision. He has provided a purpose and a promise for all of us today. So I ask the question, all we have to do is focus on him. And this is God's promise. So I ask you, what do you have in your wallet this morning? Do you have the richness of $20 bills or the worthlessness of just pieces of paper? The richness has been guaranteed to us by the promise and seal of the Holy Spirit.
Father, thank you this morning for bringing us a message of these wonderful blessings that you have given to your church. Father, help all of us this morning to be able to go home today and to refocus ourselves on what is important as your children, as members of your church, to do away with our self-pity, to do away with the what, should, put the would, to do away with what ifs, and to live a life that's rich, that has been guaranteed by the seal of the Holy Spirit, of prosperity, of all the blessings imaginable through the gifts that you give us abundantly. Father, thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the abundance. In your name we pray. Amen. As our musicians come back to the front this morning, Always remember that God has a plan for us. He provides for us. He gives us purpose. And He promises to us all the richness that He can lavish upon us as His children. All we have to do is make a commitment. This is a great time of the year to make that commitment. To make that commitment to refocus on Him. To love Him to speak His Word, to walk His walk. And when you do, my friends, you speak with the same power as God Himself. Stand with us this morning as we say, Here I am, Lord. Become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Here I am. Take me. Send me. Thank you. Throughout this journey that as Christians we walk, our whole goal as Christians is Lord, here I am, send me. Send me, I have heard you calling. Send me, I will hold your people in my heart. That's all God asks us to do, is just to tell others about his wonderful, miraculous grace and the blessings that he's given to us every day. Father, as we leave here today, be with each of us. Let us hear your voice. Let us hear what you're saying. and Let us go. Send me, God. Send me. Because I have heard your people crying in the night. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.